Listen, we're in the series, again, titled The Good Book, and the title of this uh, message in the series is Never Too Far Gone. Now, when we decided to do this series, we, you know, at the end of the year, I get with a group of my staff, and then we, we, we believe God and go through the whole year what we're going to teach, and then they put it together in weeks and that, and we just, we just believe in God. What do people want to hear? What do, what do they not want to hear? What do they need to hear? God, what is it you want us to emphasize this year? And so this year, we uh, went with this good book series. And so we're going through the Bible on some of the most significant things we think we need to learn and know as Christians to be biblically literate. We may know God. We may know of God. But do we really know his word? And so we, we're hoping that you, we all become more biblically literate. But the other thing about this is we want you to know the character of God. Because even if you don't know the, something that's being talked about in the Word of God, you can almost discern by knowing his character. And I, I don't know how many sermons I've said in over the years, and I'm thinking, that doesn't sound right. And I, and I always go to this, because God's character is different than what they're saying. And, and we need to know that in this world right now, God is the God of grace and mercy. He will be the God that judges when this dispensation ends and Jesus comes back, we'll stand before the judgment seat of God. But right now, he just wants to pour out his grace and mercy upon people and pursue them so that they may come to know him. So today, we're going to talk about Saul of Tarsus. So let me ask you this. Have you ever known someone and thought they're too far gone for God? Maybe you've even thought that about yourself. So many people live believing a lie, thinking they've done too much wrong, wandered too far away, that they're beyond the reach of God's grace. But today we're going to dive into the story of a man who was exactly in that place, a man who was the least likely candidate for redemption, and yet God met him right where he was, and transformed his life. That man is Saul of Tarsus. And if God can save him, he can save anyone. No one is too far gone for God's grace. Now, folks, I'm going to pause here for a moment, and we're going to pray for our nation. You know, I, I, I've been around a long time now, and I was with, the, you know, around when Reagan got shot, and I was, you know, real young when John F. Kennedy got shot, and then Robert Kennedy but folks, I've never in my lifetime seen where they've gone after a guy twice. That should tell us all something. Because our side, the right side, the, the Christian side, the biblical side, the, the group that believes in our Constitution, we don't go shoot our enemies. We don't go, we're, we're not after Biden and Harris, and, and they're awful, by the way. If you don't know it, they are. I mean... This woman, this woman says she wants to now go into our homes and take our guns and look. And I'm like, you ain't coming to my home. And I know policemen that said, I'm not going in. Because, you know, the good guys may let you in, but the bad guys will be like, yeah, I don't think so. It's just stupid. It's just, it's stupid upon stupid. But we need to pray for our leaders. You know, I just read a thing where that um, we're the worst in the country with child welfare. It's the worst place to raise a child and, and they don't take care of kids. But we can kill them, we just can't, just don't want to take care of them. And you and I need to begin to pray. The Bible says in Timothy that we pray for all men and all men in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. And so if it's okay with you, I'm gonna pray. And hopefully you'll be in agreement to pray for this nation. Father, we lift up this country that we live in. This is our home. This is where we live. This is where we call home, whether it's in this state or another state. This is the United States of America that you've created, God. You've set this up. You gave us the Constitution. The Constitution has Scripture all through it, the principles of your word. So, Father, we come to you and we humble ourselves and we pray for all men everywhere that all men would come to know Jesus and be saved and come to understand forgiveness and how great you truly are. We pray for all those in authority that you would deal with them and they would repent and get their lives right. And God, if they, if they don't and they're 
anti God, that you would remove them in any and however you see fit. But Father, we pray for also President Trump that, Father, it's not right that a man gets shot at. I know people have different opinions over different things. But in this country, God, you can't even have a, a decent debate anymore. But God, I pray protection over him. I pray protection over his family because he has one. I pray, God, that these uh, things would stop and cease and, and that, God, you would raise up leaders that um, would lead us. And when, when, when the leadership is good, the people rejoice. When the leadership is bad, the people moan. And, God, we're moaning today. And so, God, please don't be done with America. Please help us lead and guide and direct. Expose what needs to get exposed in this country and with these politicians. And God, help us to honor you and serve you no matter what, that you're always first in our lives. We thank you for hearing our prayers today and answering them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Acts 9, verses 1 through 16. The Bible reads, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogue in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. Now that we're talking about Christians. They called them of the way. You're of the way. Jesus said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, in Acts 26, 14, Paul begins to, or Saul of Tarsus begins to relate this story, and, and he, um, you know, adds to that and says, it's useless for you to fight against my will. In other words, he says, you, it's useless to fight against the goads. And that means you're fighting against my will. It's useless. Uh, my will will be done. Uh, it's foolishness to resist God's will. But it also has a, a meaning of, Paul, how long are you going to live and violate your conscience? And so God said, how hard is it for you to resist my will, to fight against what you know is right? But here it says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, which is interesting that he would call him Lord. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Notice Jesus didn't say you're per persecuting my people. He said you're persecuting me. Folks, when we live our life for Christ and you're persecuted, you need to understand they're persecuting the one you represent and serve. We, but we tend to take it so personal, like those people, you know, those people are whatever. But we need to understand they're persecuting the one who lives in you, the one you represent, because you're of the way. And to the world, they think we're in their way, which we are. They don't even realize we're protecting them from being totally decimated and, and God's judgment to come upon them. Because until the, as long as the church is here, God's grace and mercy is being poured out. He's trying to pursue and reach people, touch lives. And you and I need to come to a place where we understand what's happening. And so, you know, so Jesus didn't say, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you persecuting me? We get it all the time. People come against the church. So-called Christians are always attacking the church. And I'm thinking, first of all, you can't be a believer. Why are you attacking yourself? I mean, not many of us are just going to stab our bodies. I mean, some people, kids cut or whatever. And we need to help them. But, but, but most of us aren't going to go out and just break our leg. But we have so-called Christians, and they all think they're the correctors to the body of Christ. But my question is to them, who corrects you? Because most of them can't be corrected because they're right. And Paul thought he was right. Paul thought he was doing the will of God and that he was right to kill and imprison these Christians. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus, and he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. 
Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street. I could stop here (laughs) in our culture and do a whole message right here. (laughs) I would call it Normal Street, but anyway. Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas, and when you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him in a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. I love Ananias. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Paul recounts this story once again, and I I dealt with that. But Saul, who later became Paul. Now, I want you to know this. God never changed Saul's name to Paul. There's no scripture. That's how we refer to it, like God did it. God changed Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel. But God didn't change his name. And I always thought he did. I said, well, God changed it. But really, when you stayed out, he didn't. Saul was his Hebrew name that he used, but he thought because he was called to go reach the Gentiles that his Roman name was Paul, so he decided to use that name because it was more relatable to the the Gentiles and the Romans and the Greeks and the people he would go reach that weren't Jews. But God didn't change his name. He just started using it. I think it's in Acts 26, that's, a, that's when he starts calling himself Paul instead of Saul of Tarsus. But Saul was a ruthless persecutor of the early church, ruthless, rugged. He was chaining them, destroying families, having them put to death. He just, he just thought they needed to be removed from the earth. And But as we go through this story, you'll see the power of God's grace, how God can reach anyone, anywhere. Saul's story is one of a radical transformation, and it's proof that God's mercy is bigger than our biggest mistakes and or sins. Folks, people say this, you know, Pastor, I've done too much for God to save me. No one has done too much for God's grace to reach out and get. No one is too far gone. Some of you may even say, you know, there's people in the church that I've seen that I'm shocked that they're here. How many of you have seen that? I I have. I have had people come up to me and said, I can't believe they're here. And I said, who are they? And they begin to tell me, and they're saved, and they're, they're like nice people now. Because no one's too far gone. You're not too far gone. I don't care if you're watching in prison. You're not too far gone. Wherever you're watching from, no one's too far gone. That's why in the past... When I've seen, you know, bad criminals, serial killers, and people will say before they died, they got saved, and people would say, you know, Christian, how can God save them? Because God saved you. See, you, you think, because people, when they're prideful, they think they're better than someone else. Well, I didn't do that. I'm not that bad. Well, just you saying that makes you worse. Because now you think you're better than other people. Folks, that's not the heart of God. People say, well, God's going to judge me. Not today. He's going to give you space to judge yourself. And the thing that he's pursuing us with is with his grace and mercy so that we can come to know him and we can come to understand him and we can serve him. And Paul, or Saul, I'm going to use both names, he was was miserable. He He was really awful. See, Saul was actively hunting down Christians. In Acts 9-1, you heard me read, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats 
with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. That's a pretty bad guy. This man was so filled with hatred that he sought permission from the high priest to go to Damascus, arrest believers, and bring them back in chains. He was a religious zealot, a man driven by his own righteousness, thinking he was doing God's work by persecuting the early church. People do that today. I get letters, we get cards. People say, well, I'm a prophet, I'm an apostle, big deal. Say it to somebody else, I don't care. I've had people say, I'm, I'm called to be your apostle. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know you. God doesn't work that way. People that don't know me, oh, I, well, I have a word for the church, but they don't come to our church. We don't want your word. And you say, well, why is that? And I said, why would God use someone we don't know when there's a lot of people we do know? See, it's, it's, not, it's not that way God works. It's not done decently in an order. I, there was a guy here for a long time that kept writing me and said, I'm called to be your prophet. I'm like, oh my gosh. It, it's, 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 it's so ironic how people think they're better or they know more. And, and, and folks, we just gotta stay humble. We, 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 we need to understand that I'm a person, other people are people, maybe think people do things that are really bad and we consider really bad, but we're all sinners saved by grace. You can put yourself in a category and think, well, I'm not that and I'm not that. That's okay. And I don't care what people have done. I, I want them to be born again. I want our governor to be born again. I, I do. I want, I want the people around her to be born again because they're, they're really wretched. They're wicked. They're going to die and go to hell. And all the blood of those babies are on the hands of those that think it's okay. I don't want that blood on me. God took kings and destroyed their kingdoms, took them out of office, had them taken over because they wouldn't tear down the high places in the Old Testament where they sacrificed children. God hates it, folks. It's murder. You can justify it however you want. You can get mad at me all you want. But God hates it. And he's called us to defend the defenseless. Listen, John Machuco will be here next Sunday. And because he was going to be here, we asked him to go ahead and preach on Sunday. He won't preach on Saturday because he can't get here in time. But we said, hey, since you're going to be here, why don't you just preach? But you guys need to understand, this, show, this movie, this film that we're debuting, it's the first time it's debuted anywhere in the country. You get to see it first. And I think that's how people think about us across the country. And I want you to be informed what's happening in our school systems. You got men dressed up like women and think it's cute and funny. I think it's awful and sick. And they're putting them in front of our kids, calling it normal. They need to go to Straight Street. But God would save them too if they'd repent. Because his grace and mercy is pursuing them as well. How many of us know people who are so convinced they're right, so sure they're doing good, that they are blind to the destruction they are causing? Maybe that's some of us in here. Maybe you've been running in the wrong direction, thinking you're doing good but destroying the very thing God is trying to build. But here's what is so amazing about God. He doesn't wait for us to get it all together. He doesn't wait for us to wake up one day and figure everything out. No, he meets us right where we are, where we're at. And, and that's what he did with Saul. Folks, people say all the time, I'm just going to get my life in order, preacher, and then I'll get saved. No, there's no such thing. You can't do it. You don't even know what you need to work on. Because we'll say, well, I need to work on this, this, and this, and then I'll come to Christ. No, you come to Christ, then he'll let you know what you need to work on. And they may not be the things you're thinking. I didn't even know I had problems until I got saved. I was just living life. I thought I was living a normal life, doing normal boy things, going to college and doing normal college things, which were none, none of them were good. Then when you get saved, they're telling you can't do any of that. And I'm like, well, I might as well stay home and be a hermit. I, I can't do anything because that's how we lived our life. That's why we need to be transformed. So we rethink what we think is right and we start thinking the way God thinks and we think and we start meditating and learning what he says is right. That's what we all need to do. 
And so you, you don't wait to figure things out. You come to Christ and he helps you figure things out. And as Saul was nearing Damascus, something incredible happened. In verse three it says, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. Saul fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul responds with, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, which probably freaked him out because he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. But now a voice and a light and he's on his knees and, he, and, he, and, he, and he, it's funny that he says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus. Paul had to be freaking out because his whole life was being transformed right in one moment. You mean he is alive, he is real. He is the Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for. It, it, he, he is the only Messiah. See, this was a life-altering encounter with the living God. Saul, who had been so sure of himself, so certain that he was right, was suddenly brought to his knees. And it wasn't just his physical eyes that were blinded. It was his spiritual eyes that were open. For the first time, Saul saw the truth. And Jesus doesn't come to him in wrath or anger, and that's a big point here. He comes in grace and mercy. Jesus could have struck him down permanently, but instead he gives him an opportunity for redemption, just like he gives all of us an opportunity for redemption. Jesus comes now, today, not with judgment, but with grace and mercy. Folks, you don't want to experience God's judgment. You want to experience his grace and mercy and give your life to him and know that he saved you and forgive you and help you. That's who God is. I thank God for the grace and mercy of God because I need it every day. I don't look down on people. You know, I, was, I got mad and I realized I could post some things on X. So I post a few things and this one thing I posted, these people went crazy. Calling me every kind of name. It's just, it's so, it, it, and I, I said, and I finally responded to one because I was just irritated. I should never get on it. They should cut me off again, my staff. <laughs> but I said, who cares what you have to say? And why are you on this anyway? And then I laughed. And then they told me to get the blank out of the state because I'm the problem. No, well, I know, but... She's, she's my hero of the day. But it's no different than what Paul thought that they were the problem back then. See, if we don't go along with the culture, we're the problem. They said, well, people come to church, but you, don't, you, 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 you speak things that they don't want to come anymore. Well, if they want to come, they can repent. If they want to come and stay the same, yeah, go down the street. That's okay with me. Go down the street and stay the same and find hell when you die. But if you want to find heaven, this is where you come. You know, I meet men all the time, and they'll tell me they go to this church or that church, and I'll look at them and I say, man, you go to a church, why would a man go to that church? <laughs> this is where men come. Yeah. You, and I, I'll tell you why. Because we let you be men. We're not buying into the world's philosophy like we've got to feminize our men. No, we want you to be manly men. We want you to, so you can be good to your woman. And understand what that means. I'm getting way off my message. <laughs> but what I want you to understand, people say, well, God's so mad at me. No, he's not. I know I, I just must have disappointed God greatly. No, you didn't. He already knew you were going to do it before you do it, so how can he be disappointed? He just wants to make sure you keep repenting. You keep asking God for forgiveness. He's not angry at us. He didn't come to us in wrath. He comes to us today in grace and mercy. That's what we need to rely on. Jesus, again, could have struck him down, but he didn't. He didn't, he, he could have, but he didn't. He showed grace and mercy to him. He showed grace and mercy to Ananias, too. See, some have been running so far and for so long, and you're terrified that if you ever do encounter God, all he will have for you is judgment. But I can tell you this today. God is not done with you yet, any of us. He is not done with any of us in this room or watching online. He's still pursuing you. And if, you, if we wanted to, if we would ever stop running long enough to listen, you will hear his voice 
and you will see his grace because no one is too far gone. No one is. I love when I hear testimonies of people and they said, I was this and I was that, but now I'm this and I'm, I'm something different because of God's grace and mercy. God's trying to reach us, not be mean to us. In Acts 9, 10 through 16, Saul is led into the city blind and helpless. For three days he doesn't eat or drink, and the Lord speaks to Ananias to go restore Saul's eyesight. And can you hear Ananias? Uh, row, row. <laughs> Scooby-Doo for all of you intellectuals. But I could, you could hear Ananias, uh, God, do you know who this guy is? Like God didn't know who he was. Saul has been persecuting your church like God was when. I bet God was like, duh, Ananias. I know that. That's why he's waiting for you because I knocked him off his horse or his donkey, whatever he's riding, and I blinded him, and I gave him a vision that you'd come in and lay hands on him. Go, boy, just go do what I tell you to do. I know everything. But it's so funny. God wasn't even mad at Ananias. He didn't look at Ananias and said, who are you to question me? I'm God. Don't you know I know everything? He just said, Ananias, listen, just go. Just go do what I ask. He saw you in a vision, Ananias, go do it. And he went and did it. God doesn't treat people like we treat people. God knows everything. He knows everything you're gonna do before you do it, good or bad. And he still cares and loves you. It doesn't give us an excuse to reject him or ignore him, but it does help us walk this earth. Because when you go home today, or some of you go home, and this week you blow it really bad, then you need to come back next week because the God of mercy and grace is here to meet you. He's here to forgive you and help you. God says go because he has chosen him to tell the gospel to Gentiles, kings, and the people of Israel, the Bible says. See, God doesn't just save us to sit on the sidelines or in the stands. He saves us to do something. That's why he saves you. So many get saved and they sit on the sidelines or they want to be in the stands to be spectators. When you need to be producers, when you need to do something, God didn't save you for you to do nothing. God saved you for you to do something. That's the bottom line, guys. So if you're on the sidelines, you need to get in the game. I mean, when I was young, whether, when I played sports, I hated to be on the sidelines. I hated to be on the bench. I wanted to be in the game. Whether I was good at it or not, I wanted to be in the game. Why? Because that's where the action is. That's where everything happens. And too many of us are on the sidelines. We're spectators. You know, I can go to a basketball game, and I can watch any official for two minutes and tell you whether he's is any good or no good. By one thing, that if a shot is shot, and the official watching it goes like this and watches the ball, he's spectating, he's not officiating. When I first started officiating, they would think, I'd be watching the ball because I didn't know, they would taught me, and so I'd watch the ball and things would happen here and coach would be screaming at me, yelling at me, and my problem was I had no, re I had no understanding why. What are, you, what are you yelling at? Because I wasn't officiating, I was spectating. A guy came out of the stands and I believe God did this and said, hey, can I, can I just talk to you for a minute? Be between halftime at a game, at a varsity basketball game. And he said, dude, what, what are you watching the ball for? And I said, what? And he goes, you're spectating. You gotta officiate this thing. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're watching the ball. And too many of us are watching everybody else do things and we're not in the game. So I said, well, what do I do? And he said, you gotta practice keeping your head down and just watch your area because then you'll start noticing why the coaches are yelling at you. So I would, so after that, that halftime, I was like this. When I was underneath the basket, and for the next 10 or so games, I stood like this underneath the basket. Why? To, so I could teach myself to, to get in the game. And you and I need to teach ourselves to get in the game and quit spectating. Because God didn't save you to spectate or to be on the sidelines. He, he saved you for a purpose. Saul, the chief of sinners, and God gave him a purpose, and God has a purpose for all of us. If you would, put on the board 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. 
Paul considered himself the worst of all sinners, and yet God had grace and mercy upon him. Saved him for a mission, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Folks, you and I need to understand that right now God is pursuing each human being on this earth with grace and mercy, not wrath and anger. And if we'd repent, we would experience that grace and mercy in a real way. See, no one is too far gone for God to save and give them a divine purpose. Saul was one of the witnesses who watched Stephen be stoned to death. He was complicit. He was a man filled with murderous intent, ra ravaging the church, dragging men and women to prison in chains. See, no one is too far gone. God specializes in taking the least likely, the most broken, the most sinful, and turning their lives around for his glory. Saul wasn't just forgiven, God used him in a big way. He wrote a big chunk of the New Testament. Some people believe two-thirds of the New Testament was written by Paul. Saul of Tarsus. God used him in a great way, but he suffered many things. He was left for dead, beaten to death, stoned. Not, not high, but stoned. <laughs> with rocks. You gotta clarify things today. People said, oh man, I could see a stony leaving here saying, Paul was stoned. You know. <laughs> what do you think about that? I don't know, you know. Somebody like, how do you know that? I don't know. Watch some TV. <laughs> and God is waiting to redeem you and give you your purpose for life. We have an epidemic in our country, depression and discouragement and all the things and anxiety because people are seeking their purpose. But I will tell you this, none of us will ever know our true purpose until we come to the God who knows your true purpose and receive his grace and mercy. So if you're struggling like, what am I supposed to do with my life? Get right with God so he can show you and lead you and guide you. He's waiting to redeem you. And if God can use a man like Saul or Paul, he can use any of us. So let's seek him and accept him as Lord and serve him and watch what he can do. No one is too far gone for God to help, redeem, save, and use for his glory if we choose to believe the scriptures. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us all. I thank you for helping us. I thank you, Father, your word is true and we're so grateful to learn your word. We're thankful that you teach us and we thank you for the Holy Spirit who is our teacher, that we can learn God. Maybe we'll stop thinking so bad about ourselves and realize that we're just people. And we will falter, we will sin, we will make mistakes. We'll do it intentionally sometimes and by accident, but we'll do it. But the God we serve today is not an angry God. He's not angry at us. He's not, he's not filled with wrath towards us. He's filled with grace and mercy. And so, God, we're grateful that we can come to you and humble ourselves and get right with you, and you receive us, accept us, forgive us, and help us. Thank you, God, for your many, many blessings. In Jesus' name. If you're here with every head bowed, just for a moment, you say, Preacher, would you pray with me? I walk with God, but I walked away. And I want to I wanna experience his grace and mercy again. I want to come home today. Would you pray with me to get it right? And the answer is, I will. Or if you're here today and you say, Preacher, I'm not right with God. I, I don't know if I died, if I'd go to heaven or hell. Or some of you may say, I know if I died, I'd go to hell. But I thought I was too far gone. I, I come with hope, but in my heart, in my mind, I, I thought, man, I'm just too far gone. I've messed up too much. How could God ever want me in his family? And I just taught you that he did according to the word of God. He wants you in his family. Nobody's too far gone. You haven't done too much that his grace can't forgive and cover. All you gotta do is say yes to him. So if you're here with every head bowed and, you, and you're at the sound of my voice, you say, preacher, would you include me in your prayer? I do wanna get it right. Or
preacher, I want to give Jesus my life. I don't even understand that, what that means. But if he's the way, the truth, and the life, I want to come to him. Would you include me in your prayer today? And if that's you in Jesus' name and you say that, I'm going to ask you to do one simple thing. Are you ready? It's one simple thing. It's so simple, but it's so profound for your journey with Christ. It's an acknowledgement, if you would. And Jesus said, if you confess or acknowledge my Father before men, I will do the same for you in heaven. So if you're ready, in Jesus' name, with no hesitation, you say, preacher, include me in your prayer. Are you ready? In the powerful name of Jesus. No resistance. No hindrances. Just saying yes to God. If that's you in Jesus' name, right where you're seated, would you just lift your hand up all over this place, say, include me in your prayer. God bless you. God bless you guys. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you over here. God bless you. God bless you. I see that hand. God bless you, sir. God bless you up there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you over here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You may think you're unworthy. God bless you. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. You may think, you know, how could God really save me? I'm a nobody. I've been told all my life I'm not worth anything. And at some point I started believing it. God wants to change that. Because he created you. You're worth something. You're valuable in his sight. All you have to do is say yes. Get over yourself just for a second and just say yes. Rise above those thoughts that have been plaguing you and just say yes. Is there anybody else before we close? I'm going to look across the top first. Say, preacher, okay, I'll say yes. Man or woman? Is there anybody? I'm going to look across the top. Anybody else? Thank you. God bless you. As I look across the but thank you. Thank you right here in the bottom. Anybody in the bottom second? Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God loves people, guys. That's all I know. And his grace and mercy is being poured out now upon all of us so that we can repent, give our lives to him, and watch how he uses it. God bless you. Thank you. And if you lifted your hand, it's because the Spirit of God has drawn you and you've said yes. He won't force you. He leads and guides. The devil pushes and shoves. Anybody else before we close? I don't know why I'm hesitating, but I am. I'm just looking at the ushers to help me. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. God does care. God bless you, sir. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for all the hands who are raised. There's so many. Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. God bless you guys. I lift up each and every one of them to you, God, and I present them to you. They're your people, your creation your children as of today. God, may your grace and mercy be poured out on them so much that they experience your love and your kindness in a way that maybe they won't ever be able to describe, but they know. Because God, you're a good God. Bless each one in Jesus' name. And if you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer aloud with me right where you're seated. Loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. The Bible says, we believe in our heart and confess with our mouths. And I'm going to ask everybody in here that's right with God in support of those, would you pray with us so no one's praying alone? Maybe you didn't lift your hand, but you should have. It's okay. I'm going to lead you to Jesus. Jesus is the Savior of the world. I can't save you. This church can't save you. Your church affiliation can't save you. Only you believing in your heart and confess with your mouth. Would you pray this prayer aloud with me, church? Would you pray, God, I choose to believe in your son, Jesus. And I believe he's real. And I believe he's the only way. And you raised him from the dead to give me a new life. So today, I believe with my heart. And now I willingly confess, according to your word, with my mouth, Jesus, be Lord of my life. I thank you for saving me, for forgiving me, for helping me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord, church.